Good morning. I'm glad you're here today. We've been going through the Old Testament at this point. And we're doing it in, in a good bit of, uh, with some good digging. We're trying to look at it from an archaeological perspective. We're trying to look at it from a Hebrew perspective. We're trying to look at it from a theological perspective, a historical perspective, and a biblical student perspective, all rolled up into one. And in the process of that, we've actually had some really fun stuff. If you're, if you're visiting today or you haven't been with us regularly, one of the things that we've been trying to do at this class that, that, that we've been able to do through the grace of this church is get plugged in to literally the cutting edge of biblical research right now. Things that are going on in the world, people who are challenging the, the veracity of Scripture, as well as people who are standing up for the integrity of Scripture. And we, I got an email from a, um, a gentleman who's one of the readers of our class lessons each week. And he's a, an archaeologist who is going to be overseeing a dig in Israel this summer that I think at least one of our class members is going to dig on with him, uh, uh, having met him recently at, at a, a, a speech. But anyway, he wanted me to be sure and point out to you that this issue of biblical archaeological review that just came out has a massive article that, that he says the guy had to be reading your lessons online. That's not true. Um, because I, I know it's not true because this, I, I talked to the publisher about this article and, and it had already been in the can for a couple of, of uh, days before our lesson. But it does go after the very things that we were talking about. It's written by the head of the dig of the city of two gates, Sha'ariam, if you remember that lesson. And he's going after Israel Finkelstein, who we've been going after in this class as well, uh, arguing against his position that's trying to take away from the Old Testament's truths. And so it's uh, uh, up here. This is uh, Larry Burgess from our class's copy. Thank you, Larry, for bringing it in. Now, having said that, let's get started today. We are still in the divided monarchy. This is a time when Israel has already come out of Egypt. They've settled the promised land. They went through the period of the judges. They wanted a king. God gave them Saul, David, Solomon, but with the death of Solomon came the divided monarchy. And I want to start by telling you about a book that I read recently. Yeah, this is not a happy book. There was a book that was, that, that's not ever going to see the light of day, I hope. Um, no, it doesn't bother me. But, but there was a book that came out, um, that, that's been written about some decisions uh, that Dr. Bob and I have made in trial. One of our trials is part of the book. Actually, several of our trials are part of the book, including one that we lost. And I, I really hate this book and said I wasn't going to say anything about it. But something happened this week. As, as uh, Becky and I were reading our, our advanced copy of the, the book, um, in the book, there are some criticisms about some decisions that I made as the trial lawyer. And they're not just criticisms by the author of the book. They're criticisms that the author is reporting that other people made about what I did. Yeah, Bob, I'm frowning too inside. It hurt my heart. I don't like to be criticized. And, and so they've got this trial that I lost under a microscope and they're staring in great detail at everything that I did. And one of the fellows who seems to have been a little critical of some of my decisions also got an advanced copy of the book. I know that because he sent me an email this week. Yeah, it popped up just like that. <laughs> sent me an email this week. And the email said, uh, some of these quotes don't sound like me. Because he's starting to backtrack. Because he realizes now that the stuff he said about the decisions that we made, that I made... I'm already trying to deflect them by bringing Bob into the loop that we made. Uh, no, decisions that I made. He knows that I'm going to read where he basically says maybe the case was lost because Mark did that instead of what I told Mark he should do at trial. So he says, some quotes don't sound like me. And then he said, she did have a passage where it sounded like I challenged your handling of the case. Anytime I saw you in the courtroom, I thought you did an extraordinary job. Don't be mad at me when you read it. Well, I emailed him back. And in the email that I sent him, I said, um, listen, 
you are my friend. And you are my friend not because you believe I always do everything right. You're my friend because we're friends and we've decided to be friends. And it's very possible that I made the wrong mistake. I made the wrong judgment call. I'm not perfect. I don't call everything right. I do the best I can. I still think I made the right call, but I could be so wrong it's not even funny. So it does not... It's not fun for me to read that you disagree with me, but heavens, you might be right and I might be wrong. It certainly doesn't get in the way of our friendship. Now, I'm never talking to the guy again. <laughs> but, I, no. but, but I sent him that email. No, He's a good guy and, and, you know, it's just a difference in opinion. But I started thinking about it because this email chain happened right as I was sitting to write this lesson. I'm sitting at the computer to write the lesson, and I'm sitting there thinking, now I wonder how I should start this lesson. And poof, the email comes up. And I was reminded of our tendency to see the world through our own glasses. And I see it from my perspective. And he sees it from his perspective. And I'd like to tell you that I'm just right. Because I see it this way, and I do believe I'm right. But I've got to be honest enough to say that I might be wrong. And I don't really want to see it through my glasses. I'd like to see it for the truth. There's this wonderful story that the ancients tell. It's the story of a boy named Narcissus. And Narcissus was a 16-year-old boy, as Ovid relates the story. You can read it by different ancient writers. But Ovid wrote him as a 16-year-old boy who was absolutely lovely to behold. The most beautiful thing, his mother was a nymph, a water nymph. He was just a beautiful boy. And he was prideful, haughty, and arrogant because he knew it. And so people would come up to him and they would want his affection and they'd want his attention. One woman came up to him, a nymph herself. Her name was Echo. And she called out to him, come here, come here. And he'd say, oh, I'm beautiful. And she'd call out, beautiful. And everything he said wonderful about himself, she would echo. And that's where we get the word echo from. Is this character and 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 he wouldn't have anything to do with her so she calls and and actually another one calls down a curse on him may he fall in love with something that he cannot have because he won't seem to like anything that loves him and so he comes to this still pool and he looks in the still pool and he sees his face and he doesn't understand that it's not a real person and this is before the age of mirrors. So he sees it and he thinks, wow, now that's, a, who, that's the love of my life. Which I guess means he was homosexual, but that's not really part of the story. So anyway, I just, it did, does, you know. I mean, he's sitting there looking at himself and that's the love of my life. So leave that aside, that's another day. But anyway, he's looking there and he says, man, you are handsome. But there's no response. And he tries to kiss the water, but he doesn't get much of a kiss. A, it's a wet kiss. He doesn't get very far. And, and it's just going nowhere. And finally, he withers away and dies because he can't pull himself away from his own reflection. We get a word from that. What's our word? Narcissism. Narcissism is a condition where we have this overweening and overwhelming pride, emphasis, vision where we seem to be the center of the world. And everything seems to rotate around us. And it's how we see it that is reality. And heaven forbid someone not see it the way we see it because we must be right. Narcissism. It's something, maybe most of us don't have it to a clinical level, but it's something we all need to fight against. Let's talk about why as we look at the story today. This is, uh, 
um, we're going to try a new toy, and I don't quite have it working as good as I want to, but let's see how this toy works, maybe. Okay, we come here, we hit that button right there, we want a pin. Okay, this is Israel. Yeah, I think this is going to work. Okay, this is Israel. You recall right about here, there, that's kind of thick. That divides the north from the south. The north is being ruled by, in the divided kingdom, who's the ruler? Y'all remember? Jeroboam, good. And the south is being ruled by a guy who sounds like he should be related just because their names rhyme. Right, Rehoboam, but they're not related. All right, so Rehoboam's got the south, Jeroboam's got the north, and that's who we're looking at today. And as we look through this, this is what we're going to find. Uh-oh. See, now we're already in trouble because I've hit, what does that mean next? I don't know. Let's go there and see what happens. Ha! That! Okay, that's cool. I kind of leave that aside for a minute. I may not be grown up enough for that toy. Okay. As we work, though, it's gonna, we're going to get to it. Jeroboam. The guy in the north, in his life, he got three prophetic words from the Lord that we know of. Prophetic word number one, you will be king. This is at a time where Solomon's still ruling, recall? And Jeroboam, who had been one of the foremen for Solomon, helping build the temple of Yahweh, is told, you're going to be king. Of course, it doesn't happen immediately. He flees to Egypt. Uh, problems arise. But ultimately, he becomes king. And with that promise, that prophecy came a promise. If you'll be a king like David, you'll have a dynasty. But if you don't, you won't. So you will be king. Second prophecy is as almost as soon as he takes over. He just doesn't anymore be like David and the man in the moon. Remember, he built the two golden calves. He sets up worship at two different places in north Israel because he doesn't want the people to go down to Jerusalem, south Israel, where he doesn't reign. So in north Israel, he sets up his own altars, and a, war, a man from God comes and says, gives a second prophecy, the altar you're leaning on is going to fall. And it comes true. And then there's a third prophecy, which is today's lesson. And that's what we're going to look at right now. It concerns his son named Abijah. Now, <laughs> we're going to try it one more time here. Let me turn the eraser around. Uh, let's try this. Abijah. How many of you have been practicing your Hebrew? Very good. For you, we get to look at this word. Abijah is actually two different Hebrew words. We have an, an Aleph. Ooh, that's going to be even... <laughs> okay, let's go to the Elmo. <laughs> let's go to the Elmo. Hebrew words. The first word is the Hebrew word um, Av. A, B. Ab. Anybody remember Father Abraham? That means father. Okay? And when they add that I at the end, which is the Hebrew Yod, when they add that I at the end, it means my father. So Avi is my father. Yah is the abbreviation. It's the Yod and the He. And it's an abbreviation for what? Yahweh. Jeroboam has a son, and he names his son Abiyah. Yahweh is my father. Now that sounds pretty pious, doesn't it? That's pretty good. Sounds like he's off to a good start. Names his son Yahweh is my father. This is Jeroboam who built Yahweh's temple for Solomon. He was a foreman on the building job. And he names his son Yahweh's. This is Jeroboam who was prophesied. Yahweh is going to make you king. He becomes king. And he names his son in tribute. If we can go back to the PowerPoint, please. So 
ignore the scribble and look at the rest of them. So Abiyah is the son of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, who starts out as a builder of the temple of Yahweh, as a leader, a foreman on the job site, a king who starts out faithful, believing God and his promises, over time becomes an idolater who is faithless. And I'm sure if you went to him and said, hey, why did you become an idolater and faithless? His response would not be, oh, I just wanted to ruin my world. I'll bet you nickels to pennies. No one gambled too much, it's church. Nickels to pennies that he'd tell you something, well, I've grown past my faith of my childhood. You know, that, yes, that Yahweh stuff, that was great, building the temple and all, and yes, but I've become king, I've learned so much, I've, I've got foreign wives. It turns out there's a whole set of gods out there. You know, that Yahweh alone stuff is fine for the young and immature, but as you grow, you learn so much more. And that's probably what I suspect we might have heard from him. I don't know. But I'll tell you, he had to send his wife incognito to a prophet because, what? Well, you can't tell me that's not what she looked like. She was incognito. We don't know. See, here's the problem. His son, Aviyah, got sick. And nobody can heal him. And he's worried about the kid dying. So now all of a sudden he's thinking back hmm, there was that prophet way back when that said I was going to be king. Now I'm king. He's an old guy. His his vision's almost gone. I clearly can't go to him because I've like left the faith he talked about. But I'll send my wife. See if she can get some word about what we need to do for the boy. So the wife dresses up incognito, like this is really going to fool the man of God, okay? You've got a prophet who gets a word from the Lord, but he and God are going to be fooled by this disguise. Could the king have been so stupid as to think that? Maybe. Maybe he thought it may not work, but hey, what's there to lose? You know, at least give it a try. One of those Hail Mary passes where you just hold your breath. And think, I might get away with this. So she goes, but God is not fooled. Before she even gets to the prophet's house, God tells the prophet, hey, Jeroboam's wife's about to come to you and find out about the kid, and here's what you're supposed to say to her. And Jeroboam does. She gets a message from God. He has five points to his message. Point number one, Jeroboam is condemned. Let's look at the text together. It's in 1 Kings chapter 14, starting with verse 6. Verse 6. But when Ahijah, that's the prophet, Ahiyah, heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door. He says, come in, wife of Jeroboam. She didn't even get to knock. Her costume was totally for naught. She spent all that time finding those sunglasses at a bargain rate, and she didn't even need them. Why do you pretend to be another? I'm charged with un." bearable news for you. You go tell Jeroboam, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in his eyes. But you've done evil above all who were before you. You've gone and made for yourself other gods. You've made metal images. You've provoked me to anger. You've cast me behind your back. Therefore, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam. 
I will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel. I'll burn up the house of Jeroboam like a man burns up dung. Well, I don't know how she was feeling at that point. I suspect it was, why does he always send me on these trips? But I may be wrong. But then it goes from bad to worse. He says, and every male's going to die out. We'll go back here. He says, I'll bring harm. Every male, bond and free, will burn up as a man burns up dung. Any, dung. any belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. Anyone who belongs to Jeroboam who dies, whoops, dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens will eat. For the Lord has spoken it. So you're going to lose all the males, and they're not even going to get a decent burial. Go back to the PowerPoint. Part two. Part three. Your son you came to check on, he's going to die too. In fact, he's going to die before you even get back to see him. But there is a special place in my heart for him. At least he's going to get a good burial. Let's go back to the text. Arise, therefore, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child will die. And all Israel will mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, have a legitimate burial. Because in him there's found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel, in the house of Jeroboam. I wonder if it was his name. I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. What else do we find out? If we go back to the PowerPoint, next, there's going to be a whole new dynasty. I guess that makes sense because he's dying out and all of his male offspring. But the way it's said here, moreover, Yahweh will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the house of Jeroboam today. The house of Jeroboam will be cut off. Last point in this message from God, if we can go back to the PowerPoint. Israel will go into exile. And the way God explained it, if we can go back to this text, through the prophet, he said, Henceforth, Yahweh will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates. Because, look at this, they have made their Asherim, provoking the Lord to anger. He will give up Israel because of the sins of Jeroboam. The Asherim. Asherim, that's plural in Hebrew because they had a bunch of them for Asherah. That's the singular. Asherah, a feminine singular name. We can go to the PowerPoint. So Israel's going into exile. This is the message she gets. Now, I want to take a time out because we need to talk about Asherah for a moment. Asherah. Have you read anything in the news lately about God's wife edited out of the Bible? March 18th, 2001. Discovery News gives us this. God's wife edited out of the Bible almost. God's wife, Asherah, was a powerful fertility goddess, according to a theologian. In 1967, Raphael Patai was the first historian to mention that the ancient Israelites worshipped both Yahweh and Asherah. Okay, first of all, this is really bad reporting. In 1967, Raphael Patai was not the first historian to mention that they worshipped both. The guy who wrote Kings said it. <laughs> Long before 1969. I am constantly amazed at the biblical illiteracy of the world, including reporters, including theologians. Get a load of this. The theories gained new prominence due to the research of Francesca Stavrakopoulou. I may not be pronouncing her name just right. If she sees this on the internet, I apologize. 
who began her work at Oxford and is now a senior lecturer, a senior lecturer in the Department of Theology and Religion at the University of Exeter. Here's what she says. You might know him as Yahweh, Allah, or God. But on this fact, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, the people of the great Abrahamic religions are agreed. There is only one of him, writes Stavrakapalulu, in a statement released to the British media. Quote, he is a solitary figure, a single universal creator, not one God or many, dot, 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 or so we like to believe. And she adds this. After years of research, specializing in the history and religion of Israel, however, I have come to a colorful and what could seem to some uncomfortable conclusion that God had a wife. Asherah. I've got the article. I've printed the whole article out for anybody who wants to read it. I'll have it up here afterwards. And then uh, you can put it in the trash where it belongs. The... Well, it does, okay? And it got picked up by a bunch of media in a lot of different places. And th this just flabbergasts me. That this gets reported and that a senior lecturer, this is, they're, they're doing a three-part TV series on this. Okay, what does Scripture say? Scripture says God revealed himself as one God, and Israel never could get the hang of it, and they went and worshipped other gods, including Asherah. This wasn't edited out of the Bible almost. It was put in the Bible because it is what happened. You had a bunch of Israelites living back then who thought God must have a wife, and they start celebrating Asherah, a fertility goddess, who some scholars at least say came from Assyrian religion, which is rather ironic because it's the Assyrians who will take Israel into exile. You want to worship their gods? Fine. Go with them. But the whole point of Scripture is that Israel was doing this. This isn't some new revelation that archaeology has done that shows that Scripture has been, been distorted and, and ripped apart over time. No, it's the lamentable, sad story of Scripture. These people need to come to Champion Forest Baptist Church before they start teaching at Oxford. Okay, that's the time out for Ashira. By the way, I brought you one. This is an Asherah idol that was dug up in Israel. I'll have it up here for you to feel, touch, handle afterwards. It dates from about 900 B.C., which is in this time frame. And, and this is real. And it, we don't have cameras that zoom like on this, do we? Or should I put it under the Elmo? Which is better? Elmo. Okay. Whoa, whoa, no, no. Okay, there she is. Now, Asherah, if you read about Asherah in the Bible, I'll try to be real still. There you go. All right, she's kind of slanted. Ah, there we go. All right, look. Oh, that's great focus. Got real fancy hair. She's got quite the do. She's very proud of her Barbie-esque figure. Those are her arms. She's got a, a, a feminine face. But look at her legs. What does that look like from the waist down? She's coming out of a tree trunk, isn't she? Doesn't that kind of look like a tree trunk? The reason why is because she was associated with tree worship. You read about Asherah poles in Scripture. This, that was the tree. And so they would cut down the trees that they were. It's like a totem pole type deal almost. So... Anyway, um, you're welcome to come look at it. Don't break her because even though we break idols normally, um, this is fake in the sense that it, there is no truth to an idol. So we don't, kids, we don't need to break it, okay? But um, it's, it's real. I mean, it's one that's, they found thousands of those in Israel. We don't have the only one here at church today. But it's, Worship of idols and turning away from God 
that brought this condemnation on Jeroboam. And everything that God said would happen, happened. So at the risk of really overkilling on this thing, let's go back to our map and see if I can do it this time. Okay, we go here, we hit that, we say give us a pin. Now, here's what happens. Right here is kind of the dividing line between north and south. So you've got north up here. You've got south down here. You with me? Okay, that looks kind of goofy, but we're getting there. All right, Jerusalem is just right about here. Right about here. All right, well, I don't quite have it. I've just made Jerusalem about 20 miles across. All right, it's not that big. It's a few acres. But it's, it's in, this is hill country. This is the southern hill country right here. And so all of these are hills and mountains. Now, the northern part of Israel up here, it's got some hills. Oh, boy, I've got to get better at this. It's got these hills here, but it's also got this verdant valley that follows the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee. And so there's lots of, of, of crops and things like that. Now, you don't have that down here in Judah. In Judah in the south, it's all mountainous. In fact, Israel itself is on a mountain. Let's, let, let me see if I can advance this slide. This is um, um, a big wall at Karnak in, in Israel, I mean in uh, Egypt. And what you see here is a picture of a pharaoh. Shishak is what he's called in the Bible. Shishank is the way they would have called it in, in Egypt. That was his, he was Shishank I. And by the way, the Egyptian chronology of this wall measures up perfectly with the biblical chronology in the Bible. We're talking about 926, 927 B.C. When Shishank comes and invades Judah and Israel, and it's part of God's judgment because while up in the northern part, Jeroboam's worshiping the Asherah, Rehoboam's doing the same thing in the south. So God sends the Egyptian Pharaoh in, and this is an actual um, inscription that the Pharaoh had done after his campaign. And it's got the names of the towns that he conquered in Israel and in Judah. Megiddo was one of the towns. In Megiddo, he built uh, his signature. He left his calling card. Pharaoh Shishak was here. And archaeologists have found it. It, it, it meshes up extremely consistently with the biblical story. Although some scholars who want to discount the Bible will say, amidst all of those cities, it never says that he conquered Jerusalem. And yet the Bible says that he conquered and got the booty from Jerusalem. Well, actually, if you read the Bible carefully, it doesn't say he conquered Jerusalem. What the biblical story seems to convey is because he's marching through all of these towns in the southern part, in judgment, Rehoboam, the king, takes all of the booty out of the temple and meets him, probably at Gibeon, and gives it to him and says, hey, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just be your vassal. Which is consistent with the engraving and consistent with Scripture. And so in judgment from this idolatry, the Egyptian Pharaoh comes in and he, he basically becomes the, the sovereign lord over the south of, of Judah and the north of Israel. We see it in Scripture, and we see it here as well. We also see it in Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Where? 17 minutes into the movie. Indiana, the Hebrews put the broken pieces, Ten Commandments, in the ark when they settled in Canaan. They put it in the Temple of Solomon. Colonel Musgrove, in Jerusalem, for those who didn't know where the Temple of Solomon was. Indiana, where it stayed for many years until, whoosh, it's gone. Where's the Ark of the Covenant now? That's the point of the movie. Okay? So, it continues. Whoosh, it's gone. Major Eaton, where'd it go? Indiana. Nobody knows where or when. An Egyptian pharaoh, Shishak, invaded Jerusalem around 980 B.C. Okay. He's a little off on his chronology. It's 927, 926, 925, somewhere in that three-year range. But that's okay. He is, after all, a movie star. Invaded Jerusalem about 980 B.C. and may have taken the ark. We don't know. There's one reference to the ark 
after this event in Scripture by one reference. I mean, one reference that makes you think the ark may have been still in Jerusalem, still in the temple. But basically, the ark's gone from the pages of the Bible after this. And that reference to the ark is not necessarily that the ark was there at the time. It's in Second Chronicles. And so, this may be when the ark left. Because we do know that all of the gold and all of the temple treasures and the treasures of the king, Rehoboam gives because he's got to get the Pharaoh out of there. Do you know how much easier his life and his people's life would have been if they had just worshipped the Lord? Rehoboam. Well, he gives birth to a son. He names him either Abiyam or Abiyah, depending upon whether you're reading the account in Kings, which was written first, or in Chronicles, which was written later. You're sitting there saying, oh, does this mean there's a contradiction in Scripture? Absolutely not. I think this fella had two names. He had a name, which was very common, by the way, if you're going to become a king. You take a name when you take the throne. So one of these is his king name. One is Avi Yah, which means Avi is my father, Yah is Yahweh. The other is Avi Yom. Yom was a pagan sea god. And it gives you the flavor for what he was as a king. He was just like his dad. He worshipped the idols as well. He gave birth to a son. His son took over the throne. His son's name was, was Asa. Asa starts out really good. And this whole time these guys are reigning, they're having fights. They're having a civil war. Here's where the war is. All right. See, I'm going to start getting good at this. Pen. Okay. Here's what we've got. We've got the south here, right? That's our south. Then we've got, so this is the north, and this is the south. Whoa. Now, right here is a plateau. It's where Benjamin settled. And it's the dividing line between north and south. And it's what really everybody wants. It's the important part of the geography. If we go back to this. They weren't just fighting because they wanted more land. They were fighting over something special. They were fighting a civil war over Benjamin. Now, this map, you've got a black and white in your thing. This map I took from an incredible thing that I found called Regions on the Run. And when this is posted on the internet, I won't have this slide, these next two slides on the internet, because while the publisher gave me permission to put it in the handout to you, I don't have permission to post it on the internet in this form until they finish all of their work. But this is something that everybody ought to buy. I mean, it's got not only the most incredible three-dimensional maps that go up through the time of Christ of the Holy Lands, but it's got um, good, solid, biblical explanations of how important the geography is in understanding biblical passages. So anyway, I've stolen this map with their permission for the PowerPoint purposes. We'll remove it when the PowerPoint goes on to the Internet. Uh, it can stay in the video, but it can't uh, be on the, the PowerPoint that people can download. So please understand why, and I'm sorry about that, those of you who, who download these PowerPoints. But here's what you see there. Let's blow it up a little bit. If you can make it out there, there's Benjamin. This is the plateau of Benjamin, right? Uh, uh, this is why I brought the pen toy. This is where we really need it. Okay, here is the plateau of Benjamin. Can you all see that where it says Benjamin right there? Okay, this is Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem is just real, it's the northernmost border of Judah. This is all Israel up here. These are the northern tribes that are coming down fighting. This is the southern tribes. Now, why is the plain of Benjamin important? Israel is stuck in the mountains. This area right through here is where all the roads are. If you want to go to the coast, you go out that way. If you want to go to Galilee, I mean go to the Jordan River, you go that way. If you want to get out of Jerusalem, you've got to go through Benjamin. Jerusalem's got no use otherwise. That's where all of the roads are. You gotta have a, you've got to be able to get on the trade routes. 
If you're not on the trade routes, you can't trade. You can't buy, you can't sell. So they're fighting over the trade routes, the lifeline of Jerusalem. Now think about this for a minute because I want you to be Asa, the king of Israel. The north has come down and kicked you right out of Benjamin. You've lost your roads. The north has won the military battle down in Benjamin, and you're stuck in your mountain stronghold. Oh, they may not be able to conquer Jerusalem, but you're going to dwindle away and be nothing. You've just got your mountainous terrain, but you don't have access to the highways. In fact, what happens... Let's, I'll advance the slide here. This is a, a, a view... Front of the that is the plateau, the, the the place where you can see the farming and all. That's the Benjamin Plateau. You've got the ancient site of Gibeon. That little mountain area is just a built-up town over the years. But that's the road. That's the flat area. That's how you can get to the ocean or the Mediterranean. That's how you can get to the Jordan River and the Jordan Valley and the Rift Valley down to Jericho. That's how you get anywhere. You've got from Jerusalem, you go out to that plat, go north to the plateau, and that's where your roads are. And that's what Asa lost in this civil war because the north came down and took it over. So what does Asa do? Well, the, the Asa says, and I hope this isn't too complicated, and if it is, I'm sorry, it's not that the material is, it's that I may not be doing a good job teaching it. But it, this is really important to understand, to, to put yourself in the position of Asa. So here's Asa. He's right here. We'll put an A. A for Asa. He's in Jerusalem. The north has come down, and the north has taken all of the Benjamin Plateau. And Scripture says that the king of the north, the king of Israel, fortifies Ramah, which is the town right there in the middle of Benjamin, so that nobody can go into Jerusalem and nobody can go out. He builds a fort right there at the mouth of the, 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 the plateau where Israel is stuck. So Asa is down here. Here he is, and he is getting walloped by Israel. So you know what he does? He gets a bunch of money together, and he sends it up here to the king of Syria. Up here is the king of Syria. And he says, would you come down and invade Israel from the north for me, please? They can't fight two fronts. If you'll invade them from the north, they'll pull out of the south. Now, politically, I got to tell you, that makes sense to me. I'm sitting there thinking, that's pretty good strategy. It's a pretty good strategy. Asa. I can't get them to stop beating on me, so if I get someone up higher beating on them, they'll have to retreat. Doesn't that make sense? No. Not under the microscope of God. The prophet comes and says, you relied on the king of Syria instead of the Lord your God. You took the treasures of the house of Yahweh that had been rebuilt up since your dad gave them to Shishak, you took the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the king's house and you went and bought Syria and had Syria attack your brethren to the north, Israel. When you should have just trusted, you sh your, first, your first line of defense is the Lord. When you have trouble in your life, your first line of defense is the Lord. Before you figure out what you're going to do, Ask God what you should do. God may have said, take your goodies and go buy the king of Syria off. That may have been what God would have told him to do. But he never checked. He didn't, and when the prophet came and told him that, Asa the king got so mad at the prophet he had him locked up in jail. And, and maybe as a result, the text doesn't explicitly say it, but it sure seems to indicate Asa got real sick, got a disease of the feet. I don't think he was walking right before the Lord. 
So his feet get diseased. And do you know what Asa does? Did he learn his lesson? God, I'm sorry. Fix my feet. No. He calls the physicians and ignores God again. At which point the prophet says, okay, well, that's like strike three. And he dies. A's under the microscope. Not so good. Mistakes. Saw the world through his own lens. So Asa, just like King Jeroboam, starts out faithful. He was destroying the Asherah. But over his life, instead of being faithful, he becomes self-directed. Is that growth? I don't think so. Now I want to tell you the points for me as I look through this. I ask you in the beginning, how do I avoid wrongly seeing the world through my own glasses? And it's kind of a dicey thing. I have a tendency. I look, I'm 50 years old. Pastor David was talking this morning about the testimonies. If you weren't in our, in our worship time this morning, you missed a phenomenal sermon. You ought to get on the internet and download it. And he talked about a fellow in one of his churches named Craig and how Craig had this incredible testimony and he just couldn't hold it in because it, Jesus had changed his life. But Pastor David said, those of you who didn't have that elaborate testimony still have a testimony. And so I was sitting there thinking, you know, when I was 12 years old, I walked down the aisles of my church. Greg Garrett, right there, buddy of mine, went to church with me. We went to the Broadway Church of Christ in Lubbock, Texas. I walked down the aisles of that church, and I confessed my faith in Jesus as my Lord. And I did that because I was convicted in my heart that I was a sinner in need of Jesus. And I put my trust in him. Following that, I was baptized. And the world could see from the dripping water on my head the fervency of my belief. I didn't live the life of the heroin addict by the grace of God. I didn't live the life of all of the by the grace of God. But I want to tell you what happens when you give your life real early and you turn 50. There's 38 years since the time I walked that aisle. And seeing Greg makes me think about those songs we used to sing in our youth group. And thinking about how convicted I was about the reality of Jesus. And now, compared to then, I know a lot more. Now I've translated much of the Old Testament from Hebrew into English. For grades. Much of the New Testament from Greek into English. I've written lessons. I've written thousands of pages for you guys over the last seven years. I've read hundreds of pages a week in preparation of these lessons. There's been so much growth that it's so easy for me to look back and think, well, bless my heart, I didn't really know stuff then like I do now. Now I'm experiencing the real Lord. And I just want to say, time out, be careful. Because I experienced the real Lord at the age of 12. And you've got to be real careful because I have seen so many of my friends who have walked through the same walk, who went through the same Bible program I did, who went through the same... Uh, 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 Translating the Bible with the same professors who have reached a point where they have outgrown the simple Christianity of our youth. They've reached a point where, well, yes, that's what we used to believe, but then we were children, now we're adults. We know so much more. And biblical stories like this make me cringe. Because we don't outgrow the Lord. We, we, you can read history, heavens, read philosophy, 
every philosopher for the last 2,000 years in the tradition of classical philosophy thinks they've come upon something great, new, and wonderful that's it. Until the next generation improves on it. And the next generation improves on it. Because nobody's come up with it. Be careful ever thinking you have arrived. Be careful ever thinking you have the truth. Because the truth is not you and the truth is not me. The truth is Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. I am the truth. Now, that doesn't just mean that he was true in what he was and true in what he did. It means that the truth is outside of us. And it's our opportunity to cling to the truth. But the truth's not what I've got up in here. The truth was on Calvary. The truth's at the right hand of God. What I've got up in here is my, and down here, is my chance to follow the truth, to listen to the truth, to learn from the truth. I don't hold the truth. I'm not the truth. These lessons aren't the truth. My trial experiences aren't the truth. As fallen and as in shambles as anything. But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that. I've committed to him against that day. And I don't want my pride. I don't want my intellectual knowledge. I don't want my haughtiness. I don't want any narcissism, any selfishness to come between me and the Lord that I love because he is the truth. Okay? And I hope you hold on to that with me. Point for home two. Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why are you dressed up? Is it Halloween? <laughs> Trick or treat? Don't try to fool God. Don't try to fool God. Point made. Third point. You did not rely on the Lord your God. That's what Asa was told. You didn't rely. Maybe what you did was the right thing to do, but you did not rely on the Lord your God. First stop. I, I keep coming back to Greg. I'm sorry, Greg. You'll never come back. Greg buried his mother yesterday in Lubbock, Texas. And our childhood preacher who lives in Houston now, he comes here a lot to our class, Joe Barnett, went back to Lubbock to do the sermon. Greg and his son, Houston, flew him back here and stayed over for class today. But there comes a day for all of us when it ends. There, there are choices. He buried his mother yesterday. I buried my father seven years ago. And the moral to this story is whether you're doing something that is life-changing, a corner that you turn that you never can go back on, or whether you're doing something as simple as, as your day's work, don't do it out of your flesh. Rely on the Lord. Lean on the Lord. Turn to Him. He may tell you to do the exact same thing. Bring in Joe Barnett for that funeral. But you do it because you're relying on the Lord. Would you pray with me? And then next week, by the way, um, next week, we're going to pick up some more letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So get yourself ready if you want. Um, and we've got a, a good lesson plan next week. So pray with me now, please. Lord, it is time out, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you humbly on our knees, confessing to you our narcissism, our tendency to think that we have the truth in our head instead of understanding that you are the truth we seek. We love you and we thank you for giving us confidence in your truth. But may we never forget, Lord, that it's you who are the truth and that it's we who seek you out. By your spirit, we find you. Lord, we love you. Would you please, please, please never let anything strip away our faith in you. The faith that not just saves, Lord, which, which we have your assurance on, but the faith that changes our lives day by day. May we live in the victory of that basic faith that you are the truth and the way. Please bless this class. In Jesus' name, amen.